Hello and welcome to my Learn With Me Mini Freak series. This is episode one, Overview and Paradigm. So first let's recap what a Learn With Me series is. Learn With Me is a series where you get to follow my end-to-end -end process of learning to get the best out of a synthesizer. In this case, it is the Arturia Mini Freak. So far, I've given you my first impressions. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit in more detail about the features and the general control paradigm and what to expect out of this synthesizer. So, we've listened to the sounds a little bit, but I haven't really discussed what this synthesizer is offering you. Let's start by talking about features. So this is a polyphonic hybrid synthesizer. By hybrid, I mean it mixes digital oscillators and effects with analog filters. In particular, it has six voices with two oscillators each. The predecessor to this, the Micro Freak, technically was a monosynth. It had a single oscillator, but it had a special paraphonic mode, which allowed you to make up to four instances of that oscillator, all feeding through a single filter. In this case, there is also a paraphonic mode, but since this is a polyphonic synthesizer, it has six analog filters. So when in paraphonic mode, you have an interesting behavior and you get access to 12 voices, but only one oscillator per voice in that mode. The oscillators are configured in the oscillator section. The oscillator controls, compared to a lot of synthesizers, are relatively simplistic. So you have a tuning, you have a type, of which there are many algorithms. And these algorithms and this algorithmic synthesis is the foundation of what made the Micro Freak interesting and what makes the Mini Freak interesting. And then you have three timbrel parameters for that particular oscillator type called wave, timbre, and shape. These can mean very different things in different algorithms. You have a volume control, and then an ability to switch to controlling the second oscillator. What makes the second oscillator interesting is, as well as providing sound sources just like the first oscillator, it has a number of processing modes, such as filters, meaning that the output of the first oscillator will enter the second oscillator, be processed, and continue through the signal path. Next, we have the filter, low pass, band pass, high pass. If I remember correctly, it's 12 dB per octave. This is shaped and controlled by a cycling envelope and another envelope which does not cycle, which is also default routed to the amplitude. And then in a relatively big deviation from the Micro Freaks design, we have three pretty nice sounding digital effects. On top of that, we have two oscillators, um, two low frequency oscillators or LFOs. Again, this has been significantly expanded upon compared to the Micro Freak, including the capacity to make custom waveforms. So there's really a lot available to you there. The next notable element would be the mod matrix up here. Just like the Micro Freak, you have the capacity to simultaneously route between any of the sources and any of the destinations with any intensity. So unlike a synth that has a fixed number of mod slots, you can imagine that the number of mod slots equals the number of rows times the number of columns. You also have the capacity to send a modulation source to the intensity of one of these modulations. So you have the capacity to modulate your modulations. Also, as a deviation from the Micro Freak, the Micro Freak had these three assignable parameters. These are destinations which can be controlling any of the panel controls. But rather than just having three, you have three sets of three. So you actually have nine destinations available to you there. Next section would be the left-hand controller section here. This is pretty interesting, I would say. We have in the sequencer and ARP, which I'll look at, these um, gate length and spice and dice modes, which are ways of adding variation to the arpeggiator and sequencer. I'll talk about a little bit more. We have the pitch bend mod wheel. So that means this left hand touch strip is your pitch bend, the right hand touch strip is the mod wheel. And a nice addition here, again, significant improvement over the Micro Freak, you have got two macro controls. 
Now these macro controls don't appear in the mod matrix, but instead they have their own configurations. So we can assign a set of up to four destinations for each of these macros, and those give you a lot of performance flexibility. Finally, we have this touch strip along the bottom here, which controls the arpeggiator and the sequencer. There are a lot of features to add variations to both the arpeggios and to the sequences. So there's different play orders, um, walking pattern, um, octaves, these exploding frog icons, repeats, ratchets, randomization, mutating the sequence. And the sequence itself is 64 steps long, so you have a pretty long sequence. You have a lot of ways to vary that, both arpeggio and sequencer. And you can record modulations as well as recording just playing of the keys. So from my perspective, ordinarily, I'm not a huge user of arpeggiators. I'm not a huge user of sequences, but I think it's something kind of special in this synthesizer. So I'm definitely going to go into those. Regarding how the controls work, most of the things are laid out on the panel for you here, at least the surface level controls. So we have knobs here, we have encoders here. These are all encoders. We have a display, unfortunately, a very small, albeit sharp display. At the mod matrix, we have a dedicated encoder to scroll through that. We have these buttons here. For a lot of parameters, the blue text represents a secondary function, so we can hold down shift and access the secondary function. So shift and this will allow us to adjust the oscillator tuning in octaves. Um, shift and this, which you actually saw me press, brings up the macro assignment controls here. We have a knob to go through presets, which also functions as navigation for the menus. We have a sound edit menu. We have a way to save. We have a way to set um, the sound engine to match what the panel says. And then we have a set of additional configurations here. So this is things like um, MIDI routing, tuning, and so forth. How I feel about it so far, I like the form factor. I like the design. I think it's aesthetically very pleasing. I think it maintains some of the paradigm of the micro freak with respect to being an unorthodox synthesizer but I think it has evolved way beyond that. That's to say, having the six voices and the six filters makes a tremendous difference. Additionally, having two oscillators, allowing two different sounds to be working side by side, that take thing, takes things a lot further. What I don't like so much is one, these controls being right above the keyboard, I find myself occasionally accidentally pressing them. So I'll accidentally enable the arpeggiator or the sequencer while I'm playing the keys. This is not a great experience. Additionally, I mentioned that the display is small. What that also means is that while you're using the panel, you have a very comfortable, very direct, enjoyable way of interacting with the instrument. From my perspective, once you then need to go into the menu, it feels much less comfortable and much less fluid. I think an obvious comparison point at this price would be the Hydrosynth Explorer. So I'll give you a little comparison. I would say, while you are using the panel controls here, this is more direct and more straightforward to interact with than the Hydrosynth Explorer. On the Hydrosynth Explorer, the vast majority of controls are behind a menu. Now these menus are shallow, they have lots of direct controls to interact with them and very quick ways of accessing the different sections of that menu, but they are still menus, which means that when you're performing live, having to remember to press a button to access a section and then control one of the encoders or paginate through multiple pages and then control the encoders is a little bit less convenient. Here, if I want to adjust the cutoff, now the Hydrosynth Explorer does have a cutoff knob, but there's the cutoff. They're the envelope parameters, they're the effect parameters. Because they're directly under my fingers, I find them straightforward to use. Similarly, the macro controls, there are only two and they only have four destinations. On the Hydrosynth Explorer, you have eight destinations each and you have got eight of them, but they're on encoders. 
One of the benefits from my perspective of a touch strip is it's very intuitive to reach a particular value. Additionally, it's possible to tap the touch strips to jump between values. So you can actually do rhythmic performances using those macros. I guess that's the end of this episode. Not particularly interesting, a whole lot of talking, you didn't hear any sounds whatsoever. But I hope this sets the stage for what we're going to do. Next episode, we're going to come back and we're going to start diving into each of the sections of this synthesizer and getting a feel for what it can do, designing some sounds, playing some music, and hopefully having some fun. So, as always, thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you'll join me again next time, but in any case, goodbye.